Yeah. Uh, his father had the secret recipe. Yeah. 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 Ye
you know, if you gave dedicated some time and thought about this, especially now leading up to Rosh Hashanah, that could really, you know, that simple exercise could probably really produce some great results. And that's really what Zahirus is all about. It's about living a life where you're doing these types of start, stop, keep exercises along the way, not just going through the motions. So now what he's talking about is what gets in the way of our commitment. Uh, we all, if, if you, you know, show of hands, who thinks uh, living a life of Zihirus would make me a better person, a richer person, a more, a wiser person, a more developed human being, a kinder person, who thinks that living a life with Zihirus would get me there? We all do. Everyone does. You do, Jerry. Trust me. Okay. But why don't we do it? So that's what he's addressing over here. What gets in the way? What's the, what holds us back? So he identified in the beginning of chapter five, three things. And we're in the middle of the first one. The three things are, one is we end up becoming preoccupied with worldly matters. That's what he's talking about now. Just life. Life gets in the way of us living. Ooh, that's wise. Did I, is that someone that already say that, or can I? No, you can. Can I quote coin that phrase? Life gets in the way of us living. Life, work, jobs, family, vacations, responsibilities—all the things. I think less. What did less call this? Less. Is he hiding from me? Less once said, "You have to make a distinction." Coming from getting this right, less between. Um, urgencies and vital and vital things that are vital and things that are urgent is that things what it was vital long term to you versus the urgencies that distract us from the vital things oh right right what's vital to me long term i have to know what are my real goals what do i really want to achieve in this you know 106 years of life that i may have or 120 years old what do i want to do that's vital and how do i stay on on target with that and then there are the urgencies, the fires, the little fires that come up every day that I have to put out. And we get distracted and we focus on the urgencies, the things that are right now. I've got to deal with this. If I don't deal with this, then something's going to go wrong. So I, so I set aside my long-term goals, the things that are vital to me, and I focus on the urgencies. That's life. That's called preoccupation with worldly matters. Of course, we have to be focused on some degree with worldly matters. We can't just live a life of, you know, on some planet somewhere, not being real, not taking responsibility. We have to work to, you know, get an education and, and get a job and, and figure out how we're going to make a living and, and support our family. And we, we got to do all these things. But if that becomes the focus of every minute of my life, then we lose the ability to focus on Zahirus, on this, on this you know, focused life. So one thing that always bothers me, and I understand what you're saying, but how much of that do we really have control over? And how much- Zero, <laughs> nothing. We have no control over anything. You're right. Well, you right? can't turn off the news. Right. Just I don't did. watch it. Yeah. Just yeah. don't watch it. We have control. It's a great question, Fana. We have control over very, we have control over nothing when it comes to the results. So why even bother? Because. It says in Perkei Avot, "Lo lecha melacha ligmar viyata vi einata ben chorin levata mumenu." Yes. Right. That you don't think that you're going to finish the job. Don't think that you're going to produce any results. Don't think that you're anything that you set out to achieve or accomplish is going to get done. But at the same time, you're you're not exempt from trying and working and and putting in your effort. That's just the way the uh, the way Hashem set up the world. But the end result is in Whatever. Hashem's hands, but it's your choices that matter. What ultimately you take with you after 120 into the next world. I don't want to live on Okay, whatever. Whatever, what you ultimately take with you is not what you produced, but the choices that you made. You know, you made a good choice, that's yours forever. Did it result in, did it end up in resulting in what you hoped it would result in? Maybe, maybe not, it doesn't matter. But you made a choice. You made the right choice. You did the right thing at the right moment. That's yours. It stays. So how do you know if you made the right choice? So that takes learning. That's what he's going to talk about right now. It takes it takes learning. It takes knowledge. It takes wisdom. It takes friends. It takes mentors. It takes, you know, it, it, a lot, a lot of 
it, it takes the heroes. It takes living a focused life. It takes identifying what, first of all, you can't know if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing until you've identified what's the right thing and the wrong thing, right? So that's where it starts. He talked about that in the previous chapters. You have to define what's right and what's wrong. And whatever's right, you've got to plow towards it and not let anything stop you. And whatever's wrong, you got to run away from as fast as your legs will take you and not look back. But it starts with knowing. It starts with knowledge. It starts with an understanding of what's right and what's wrong. And identifying. So what's right for you? Like what's right for me? might not be what's right. That's yeah. true. That's true. There's two, there's two, there's, there's, there's objective right and wrong, right? No one can say, well, you know, murdering is right for me and it's not right for you, but it's right for me that there's objective things that are right and wrong, but then within the context of your own personal life and your own choices and, and your own world, then you have a, a million different, you know, nuances of what's right and what's wrong. Is it right to, I don't want to get in trouble, you know. What a word in the morning. <laughs> Rabbi. Thank you. Les. The vital things are always more problematic, more complicated, more likely to be put off. We hide behind, very often, we hide behind our urgencies. We rationalize that we don't have time for the vital because we have to do the urgent. But a telephone ringing is urgent. It yes. isn't necessarily worth anything. Right. And a beep on your phone is urgent. I got to check it because, you know, who knows? Maybe uh, Beth, maybe this maybe Bath and Beyond is offering me another 20% uh, coupon, which I don't want to miss. My car warranty is about to expire. Uh, my car <laughs> warranty is about to expire. So do you um, really want to believe it? I mean, like... Well, it starts with what you believe in. What do you believe in? It starts with that. Yeah. And, not, and that's the first step is what do I believe in? This. And not what Les believes in. Well, thanks a lot. It, <laughs> well, I don't know it's both Hannah, it's both there's like i'm saying there are universal things that that human beings believe in then there are universal things that we as jews believe in and are very important and that we value but then there's always in addition to that there's my own personal things that i'm committed to you know you have things that you're committed to that you believe in very strongly that you support that you back that you invest in those are things that are important to you so you're going, you're going to focus on those things and you're going to sacrifice other things in order to give more time and energy to these things that are important to you. So we all have those. Yeah, Howard, what are you going to do? No, no, I want to hear. Um, the, I've, I talk about this all the time, but it, it always comes back to this brilliant, brilliant TED Talk. It's actually a book, but it was a short TED Talk by David Brooks. Mm. And um, he talks about the, the difference between resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Mm. We've talked about this a million times before, right? But it, it, resume virtues are the urgencies. Eulogy virtues are the, what are they? Vital. Vital, vital, vital issue, right? When you sum so, up at the end. So what are, resume virtues are, I went to this university, I got this degree, I went to this graduate school, I, grad, I went to this law school, I worked for this firm, I, you know, blah, 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 blah. Those are the resume virtues, okay? Does anyone want to write those things on their tombstone? You know, which college you went to or, you know, where you got your law degree from or whatever, what law firm you were a partner in? If you're writing that on your tombstone, that's very sad, right? What are you writing on your tombstone or what are your eulogy virtues? What do you want said about you, your eulogy, not all those things? You want said about you that you were a, a great husband, that you were a great wife, that you were a great parent, that you were a great grandparent, that you were that you were kind, that you supported your community, that you that you were a spiritual person, that you were wise, that you ruined your Judaism. All these things that you want said about you, those are your, your eulogy virtues. But if you pay attention to the way people function in this world. Most of us spend a great deal of time and a, and, and a great deal of years running after and pursuing and obsessing with our, with our resume virtues. And we sacrifice all too often. Yeah. We sacrifice all too often our, our eulogy virtue, our virtues for our resume virtues. So in the end of the day, what really matters is, and I think this is a great thing, I'm gonna do this Wednesday night, we have Toronto Tequila, I'm gonna do this with the guys, especially before Rosh Hashanah. We've done this before here. Write your own eulogy. Hmm. Write your own eulogy. What do you want said about you at 120 years old? Sorry. Okay. 
Okay, I can't say. What do you want said about you after 120? What do you want said about you at your funeral? Right? No, get get total clarity on that. And then that should get moved towards that all every day. That's Zahirus. So what gets in the way? What gets in the way of the resume or the eulogy virtues are the resume virtues. That's what gets in the way. That's what he's talking about over here. So he said, <coughs> excuse me, he said the way to the first uh, a step to avoid the pitfall of the urgencies of everyday life taking over the m- majority of your time and energy and focus is Torah study, the acquisition of wisdom. Because like we were saying, you first have to have total clarity about what are the identified values in my life and as jews we turn to the torah for that right and we understand the torah provides us with the wisdom for living the torah is an instruction manual for living it's a guidebook for us as jews to know how to prioritize things in life one of the hardest things to do in life is to prioritize you know i have a list right now i won't show it to anybody because it's you know very personal but i have a list i just this morning during davening I, wrote, down, by the way. I know that's it's in Hebrew though. Um, <laughs> I wrote down all of the things that I I have a week left here, and I and I have a lot of things that I want to do, and people that I want to see, and things that I want to get done. I just wrote them all down on a piece of paper, and now I, I can't do them all. I'm going to have to prioritize that. I'm going to have to figure out what are the things that are most important. You know, what do I have to achieve or accomplish? That's life, and, and, and we go through life that way, and we, we function that way in every day of our lives, prioritizing what are the things that are most important in my life. That's what Zahirus is about, prioritizing. But how do I prioritize in my life if I haven't uh, uh, connected myself to some system of values to help me define and guide for me how to make that prioritization work correctly? How do I know if it's more important to spend time with my mother or spend time with a student? How do I know? Huh? I, I know, but you know, it's like how much, you know, you have to make decisions in life. Just kidding. Your father. How do I know if it's, you know, the right thing to do to, you know, spend time with my kids this week who are bored out of their minds or to, you know, do having a teach an extra class at, at the set. How do I know? Those are hard decisions. We have hard. We make hard decisions all the time. Every day we're making hard decisions. What should I do now with this window of time that I have? What's the right thing to do? Maybe the right, you know, how do I know if the best thing to do right now is to spend some time with my husband or my wife or my parent, whatever it is, or to learn more Torah or to, you know, acquire some wisdom. Difficult. So you have to learn Torah to help you create that system of prioritization to align your values with the divine will, what Hashem wants from us, what Hashem sees in us, and what He yearns for in each of each and every one of us. That's what the Torah is. The Torah is Hashem's expression of this is what I what I want for you. For you, this is what you can achieve and accomplish. So it's Torah learning, and and the rabbis tell us that that is the remedy. The true remedy against the Eight Sahara is um, Torah learning. He quotes it over here on page 97. It's the Talmud and Tractate Kedushin. Barasi Yet Sahara, Barasi Lo Torah Tavlin. I created the Eight Sahara. I created the evil inclination. This is Hashem speaking, right? And I also created the Torah as the antidote against the Eight Sahara. Every one of us has a Yetzirah. Every one of us has a voice inside of us that will convince us that the wrong thing to do is the right thing to do. And it never rests. It never stops. And Hashem put that in us. Thank you very much, Hashem. Put it inside of us. And then he says, but I gave you the Torah as the antidote to that force inside of you. Right? And he didn't say, I gave you the Torah as an antidote, as one of many antidotes. The Talmud says, the rabbis teach us, I gave you the Torah as the, the one and only antidote, the one and only remedy against the power, the influence of the Yitzhar in our lives. So if we think that we have a chance 
of overcoming the Yet Sahara, of conquering the Yet Sahara, of defeating the Yet Sahara without a lot of Torah in our lives, we're fooling ourselves. It's the Yet Sahara that's convincing us. The Yet Sahara will tell us how to fight against it. You know, there's a great self help book. It's on the number one on the New York Times bestseller list. The Yet Sahara will tell you that's the book to read to learn how to, you know, fight me. No, it's not. For us, the Torah, the Torah is the way to learn how to fight against the Yetzirah, period. The one and only remedy against the Yetzirah is to learn Torah. Not just to learn Torah, but to internalize Torah. To bring it into our lives in a real way. It's very easy to learn Torah. Anyone can sit down and read words and study facts or study information. You know, but to internalize Torah, to make it real, that's what Musar is all about. It's about the internalization. The Ramchal says in, in the beginning of this book, I'm not teaching you anything in this book that you don't already know or that you haven't already heard. That's not what the purpose of this book is. The purpose of this book is to take what you know and to, and to make it real so that it's part of who you are. So he says now, on the bottom of 98, he's basically making the point that don't think that you can find some back door to fight against the Eight Sahara. The way to fight against the Eight Sahara is what Hashem told us, learn Torah. So to what can this be, to what may this be compared on the bottom of 98? To a sick person who consulted with doctors who diagnosed his illness and instructed him to take a certain medicine. Okay. I'm sure this has happened to many of the doctors here. You, know, you tell, a, tell a patient exactly what he's got to do. Here's the course that you have to take. Take this medication, try this treatment. And of course, the patient thinks that he's smarter than you. So he, you know, Googles his symptoms and he finds a better, you know, a, a way to handle this illness, comes up with a better remedy, comes up with a better treatment, and he decides he's going to do that. But without prior, prior knowledge of the science of healing, he sets aside that medicine and instead takes whatever medicine enters his mind. Won't the sick person certainly die? Right? It's not gonna, he's not going to be cured. He can't just decide for himself, well, you know, I'd rather take this. I'd rather, you know, take it through this treatment. It's not going to work. So too it is with this matter of the evil inclination. For there is no one who truly recognizes the illness of the evil inclination and the power with which it has been invested, except for its creator who created it. Who's that? <laughs> Master of the world, creator. And he, Shem, has warned us that the only remedy for it is the Torah. Who then can cast aside that remedy and take whatever else might take in, in its whatever he might take in its stead and hope to survive? No one. It is certain that such an individual's fate will be that the darkness of physicality will proceed to overpower him step by step. Okay? There's no, there is no other way. For a Jew, there's no other way. Torah is the only way to get us to a place where we have a shot against the Yitzhahar and its power and its, and its influence. And if we don't, and we try to take our own other approach that might seem harder, might seem wiser, step by step, slowly overpower us, we won't even realize it, and we'll end up in a place of darkness. And he will not even be aware of this gradual decline until he finds himself completely mired in evil and so far removed from the truth that even the slightest notion of searching for the truth will not enter his mind. Okay, you won't even, won't even dawn on a person after a while that there is something called wisdom or truth, MS, that's worth pursuing. So that's what he says. That's what he says. Yeah. The definition of learning is all today. Of course it does. I mean, that's very good. Let's put more substance. See what we see there. Okay. It's going to be interesting to see. Oh, no, of course. Right. Of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah. You do have to know the mitzvot so you know when you're violating. Yeah. Yes. But it, I mean, there's, there's, there's a million faces of Torah. There's learning the Parsha, there's learning the mitzvot, there's learning Musar, there's learning Hasidus. They're all. Um, Tehillim is an interesting thing. Tehillim is a 
It's, I'm sorry, it's Tehillim is the only thing that's considered to be tefillah and Torah. It's prayer and Torah. Yeah, it's interesting, but it is Torah. It's David Amela. Tehillim is amazing. Psalms are amazing. If you read the Psalms and, and you read them with the commentaries and you think about what they mean and what King David was trying to express and the, the inner wisdom and the soul of King David that he's sharing with us. It's his journey. It's his journey through the challenges of his life and his own chuba and his own process of... Hi, Fanny. Good morning. Quick question for you. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about. Um, how do you mute? Um, Okay, I, I muted everybody on Zoom. So if you want to ask a question or whatever, just unmute yourself. Um, so any form of Torah learning, yeah, this is for sure. Of course, this this is this is taking Torah and bringing it in. You got to do all of it. You got to know the parsha. You got to know, you know, but you also have to know the mitzvot. You got to know what's right, and not just the mitzvot. Okay, I know, you know, I know there's a mitzvah, you know, to lend money to somebody who needs it. But then I got to learn the whole tractate on it to know when it's okay and what's considered interest and what's not considered interest. It, it's endless. You got to learn and learn and learn. You got to learn the mitzvot. You got to learn the, the specifics of the halacha and how they apply. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I know that I'm going to keep Shabbos. Well, Chabetz Chaim writes in his introduction to the laws of Shabbos that if you're not studying the laws of Shabbos, you can want to keep Shabbos as much as you want but you're not keeping Shabbos because the laws are very specific and they're complicated. So you have to study them. You have to know. It's not just enough to know there's a mitzvah to keep Shabbos. What does it mean? What's prohibited? What's not prohibited? What do I have to do? What should I not do? So there's all of that. And then there's the study of Musa, which is taking it in, internalizing, it, bringing it deeper. Or if you have a, you know, if you're more Hasidically inclined, then you go to the Hasidic books and you study the deeper aspects of Apara and Neshama connects to mitzvahs and what happens in the spiritual world when we do mitzvahs. But learning is the, is the only way to get there. That's what the Ramchal is telling us. It's not the Ramchal, it's the Talmud. The Talmud specifically tells us. That. Okay. So he continues. Ramchal explains how Torah study acts as the antidote to the evil inclination. So on the page of 100, however, if one involves himself in Torah study, then when he sees the wisdom of its ways, its commandments and its warnings, the commandments meaning the positive commandments and the warnings meaning the prohibitions, in due course, there will automatically be kindled within him a spirit of inspiration. Just by learning Torah, just by coming to a Torah class or listening to a Torah class online or reading some, you know, the Parsha or reading Rabbi Sachs or whatever you, it, it, it's going to inspire you. It's going to inspire you to better be a better person. It's going to automatically, whether you realize it or not, it's going to have the effect of helping you to re realign your priorities and your values so that you're more aligned with the Ratzon Hashem, with Hashem's will, with what he wants for us what he believes that we can achieve and accomplish in our lives. And that will bring him to the proper path, okay? But, you know, if you don't have regular Torah learning in your life, then it, it's not, you're not gonna be able to get there. And as, 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 you know, as intuitive as you might be, or as, as wise as you might be, a Jew, the neshama of a Jew needs Torah, constantly replenishing Torah and learning in their life in order to be able to find the path of wisdom and find the path of, of connection to Hashem. That will bring him to the proper path. This is what the sages of blessed memory meant when they stated, that the, the Medrash says that, that sort of expressing Hashem's um, emotion on, on, on his behalf, Hashem, it's as if Hashem would say, would that they would leave me behind but they observe my Torah. That's a very, very difficult, complicated statement. Hashem is basically saying, I'd be fine if the Jewish people just left me 
and you know left my left my observance the path of observance that i set down for them as long as they still observe as as, as long as they still kept my torah well what does this mean i don't even know what this means it's like, let me just read this quickly yeah that's what it means that that if you look in the note down below that um the sages reveal here a great secret if the wicked who have left hashem behind by committing sins do not forsake the study of Torah, then they will ultimately return to the path of good. For the Torah's holiness will gradually penetrate those who study it. The cumulative power of the sublime spiritual light is so potent that it can bring even the wicked back to the path of good. Okay, so meaning even if a person has completely abandoned Torah and, and, and discarded the mitzvot and they're not living a life of observance, but they're learning, but they're still learning Torah, eventually that'll have an impact on them. It'll bring them back. It'll lead them to a place of, of Torah and inspira of inspiration and connection to Hashem. It's the power of Torah. Now think about this. If, if the Torah has the power to do that to people who are not interested in a relationship with Hashem, to the wicked, so to speak, think about the power that the Torah has to do that for people like us who are yearning for that relationship with Hashem. We're learning for that connection and that closeness. We want it. Our lives are all about it. That's why we're all here, right? Because we, we're looking for that. The Torah can guide us and get us there in incredible, incredible ways. Having explained that Torah study in general is a prerequisite for the attainment of spirituality, Ramchal turns to the subject of Zihirus and explains how Torah study facilitates the attainment of this trait. Now, included in this requirement to set aside time for Torah study is also the setting aside of time for an accounting of one's deeds and how they can, can be corrected. For this is the essence of Zahirus, as I have written above. But even aside from all this, time for designated Torah's learning and introspection, whatever free time remains for a person from his business matters, if he is wise, he will certainly not waste it. Rather, he will immediately seize upon the free time and not let it go and use it to engage in the affairs of his soul and of the improvement of his divine service. What do we do? In our free time? What? David? Yeah. Julian, yeah. Can you tell me what chapter are you on and, and where about in the chapter are you? Yes, Julian. I, I, I really, really would encourage you to get the version of the book that we're using. It's going to be so much more beneficial to you. I'll order for you. Text me your address. It's, it, this, this version of the book is a thousand times better than the old version. It's got great commentary. It's elucidated. We're in chapter five sort of towards the beginning of the chapter, I would say more towards the beginning uh, than the end. Um, okay. Yeah. But uh, this, this version is just like, it's far superior. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So um, what he's saying over here is that what do we do in our free time? What do we do when we're not working? He said, of course, you know, you, you have to attend to your business matters and you have to, of course, to attend to all of your personal matters and your family life and all these things. But what do we do when we're not attending to those things? What do we do when we have free time? And by the way, of course, we need to relax, you know, and everyone needs to have a little downtime and exercise and some leisure and, you know, a little Netflix never killed anybody either, you know. Still waiting for the fourth season of Fauda to come out. But they're talking fourth about it. Of Fauda. It's supposed oh. to be in waiting and waiting. They're saying it's coming any day. But so it's supposed to be waiting for Stissel, not Fauda. Ugh, Stissel. Don't get me started on Stissel. Um, the beauty queen of Jerusalem is much better than any of them. Uh, yeah. Nothing better than Sounds like. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. No. Sidetrack. But one second, one second, Les. I'll come to you in a minute. Um, but we all need that. We need work. We need family time. We need leisure time. We need exercise. We need, but after all that, or not necessarily after all that, I'll tell you why not after all that, but 
in addition to all that, we, what are we doing when we have time? And by the way, if you leave the pursuit of wisdom and the, um, the uh, affairs of our soul and the improvement of our divine service to when we've gotten, when we've done all of our business affairs and our family life and our leisure time and our hobbies and everything. And then whatever time I have left, I'll dedicate to matters of the soul. Spoiler alert, it's not gonna happen, right? You have to carve that time. You have to, you have to fix that time. You have, it doesn't have to be a ton of time. We're not talking about hours over here. We're not talking about, you know, going and sitting in yeshiva and learning 12 hours a day. We're talking about carving out a little bit of time, a little bit of time to learn Torah, whether it's on a daily basis or at the very least a couple of times a week and a little bit of time carved out to work on our Avodah Hashem, on our divine service, thinking about, you know, and we're heading up to Elul. Elul is all about this. You know, where am I doing well? What are the things I want to keep doing? What are the things I want to start doing? What are the things I want to stop doing? We need to have time, not, I'll get to it when I have free time because you won't get to it. I need to create that time. I need to fix that time into my schedule so that it's there. Yeah, unless it's something in the know. I'm just thinking one of the most liberating realizations about what you're saying is that it may seem impossible to attack this whole concept of elevating yourself spiritually. But what the tradition is teaching us is that if we make the attempt, we're not alone. If we have artillery that gets locked into place that's completely outside of our own effort to help us in that journey. Absolutely. There's no way we could do this on our own. All Hashem wants for us to do is make the effort. Right? Make the effort. Make the effort. Commit to something. I'm going to do this and stick with it. And then, like you're saying, of course, Hashem will, will, will kick in and he'll get us there. He'll bring us, you know, the rest of the way. All we have to do, it says in, in the Medrash, it says, open for me an opening the size of the eye of a needle. Just a tiny little opening. And I'll expand that to the size of a great banquet hall. That's Hashem's job. Our job is just to make the commitment. I'm going to learn 10 minutes a day in the morning. I'm going to add to my learning commitments, or I'm going to add a, you know, cheshbon and nefesh, spiritual accounting to my daily schedule during Elul, leading up to Rosh Hashanah, whatever it is. I'm going to spend, carve out a little time for personal prayer. Whatever those things are, a little bit of time, and Hashem does the rest. All we have to do is just turn in that direction and make the commitment. Brenda. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to go back to your list of priorities. Yes. Since I first um, about family, kids, mother, yeah, or yeah. Mother. Eve gave an example yesterday. We happened in a parking lot, and it turned out to be a huge lesson in Torah, which she developed. Um, the issue was one parking space, we don't face that, a young person trying to get into the space uh, near a synagogue, and a obviously religious man who cut him off. And moved into the parking space and the, you know, the young person was so that was witness. And um, all of our confirmation bias says, oh, this religious guy, you know, cut him off. And so she then took it apart because she said that in your judgment, maybe that man who was rushing in knew he had to be part of a minion. As possible, he was a little late and the men were waiting for him, or maybe it was a work site and he had, you know, he just really needed to say Kaddish, um, or maybe he was actually the Gabbai, or you know, whatever. So you look at that, probably the rabbi, <laughs> probably the rabbi who was running late. Maybe it was the rabbi running late. Um, so that affected our learning about not making such quick judgment, and she talked about that. Then she broke it down and she said, one was an act of man to man. He was, he was clearly rude. He cut this other young man off. Another was moving to an act of God. 
and those two things were in conflict. We had to, we had to think about mm. which was really more important. Mm. We, we worship for whatever reason we didn't know, or the man to man. And wasn't the man to man ultimately an act of man to God to mm. cut somebody off rudely? And mm. it was very obvious that what he did. Mm -hmm. And I just thought about that discussion that it didn't mean opening their babos for Torah, but it came from mm -hmm. all of our learning. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at your list of priorities, is your priority during the week you have, any of us, you know, we all have our judgment, man to man, and wouldn't that ultimately be an act of service to God? Mm -hmm. Under certain circumstances, yeah, which yeah, week you have left. And right now, I don't know about many of you, but if it's not our kids, it's our grandkids. If it's the turn of the academic calendar, everybody's leaving for college, and I, I just really have to help my kids right now. You know, and isn't that an act of God? Isn't that of an act course. of Torah? Right, absolutely. That, so that's... we didn't come to a conclusion about which one was more important, the man to man or the, or the man to God. Right. What we did was take the man to man and developed it into an act of God. Mm -hmm. So and, and it's not exactly, somebody said, isn't that a rationalization? Everything you do then becomes Torah. Why not? It, it, it can, yeah, it, it should and it can for sure. Uh, you know, and I just, my, my only addition to that would be, or to what you're saying, which I, believe is very true and 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 very well said and i think that we all it resonates with us because it's real and it's true um but we we all waste a lot of time some of us more than others some of us are more you know disciplined and and focused and waste less time some of us waste you know more time um and i'm not talking about like i said i'm not talking about watching a show i'm not talking about exercise i'm not talking about leisure time, I don't consider that wasting time. I think those are necessary parts of life. But in addition to all of that, we all waste a lot of time. And if we were a little bit more focused and a little bit more disciplined, there are additional things that we could include in our lives that would help us grow, you know, in either in the man to man or the man to God or both or whatever, you know, so I think it's an important area, important exercise to think about, you know, um, where are the where are the areas that I have a tendency to waste time, and how can I, you know, utilize the time that I'm wasting in a more productive, or effective way that's going to be bringing something good into the world, value added into my life, into the, my family, my community, or whatever whatever it might be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. I mean, there's, there's things we have to do when we say it's, we have to do it, we do it. So the idea is to make study a have to, not an add on, I have to. And the other things are the, you just have to reprioritize because, you know, you, you wake up every day and you, there's certain things you say you just have to do. Well, if you make study a have to, then it, it's on your schedule. Right. Yeah. That's it. Changing your attitude about, about, Torah and wisdom and chesed and all these things, not as, you know, it's a, it's a nice thing to do when I have time, but just like I have to, you know, go to work and see my, you know, see my patients or whatever, or just like I have to, whatever I have to do in my life, I've got to exercise. So, so too, I have to, you know, learn Torah and find time for that, make time for that. Just thinking about it. Can you talk a little bit loud so they can What's more important? I know you're going to say both. I know that, but both. Like if you B. have, if you have <laughs> a, a positive, <laughs> positive role model versus studying the Torah. I, my own experience. My father never studied Torah, but he was a positive role model in his values, and you know his neshama <coughs> from you know generations before. I think they probably gave him that. But you know, if we is there something that's more preeminent because we need to have those role models in order to, while we're studying Torah or vice versa. Yeah, the Gemara says, the Talmud says that Shimush Talmudei Chachamim 
is greater than Limud Torah, which means that um, a, apprenticing a Torah scholar, you know, serving, literally serving a Torah scholar, being at the beck and call and driving him around and helping him with his, you know, daily affairs or whatever, is more important, is greater than Torah learning. She was anybody to drive you around this week? Um, I do actually, but I don't know what that's going to accomplish right, for you. Okay. Um, Shimush Talmud Echachamim, right? There's, um, there's a, we have a very, very big, giant rabbi in our community in the remote. We didn't get to go see him, but he lives in, up in the remote Gimel. His name was Rabbi Usher Weiss. One of the giants of the generation. And a friend of mine, who maybe you did meet Dr. Menachem Srader, he, every morning, he, he drives to his house at 6 a.m., picks him up, drives him to shul, gets him, help, brings him up, you know, to shul, gets him situated, and then he leaves and comes, and then he goes, he doesn't even dive in there, right? So he is, um, he is doing this mitzvah of shimush tamadei chachamim, of serving a Talmud chachim, serving a Torah scholar, and that's considered more important than limud Torah, learning Torah itself. Why? Because the Torah ultimately is something that has to be lived, you know. I got into a discussion with somebody yesterday, last, last Shabbos, very frustrating. And I said something, I quoted the, the Talmud, I said, the Talmud says this, and he goes, the Talmud is a book. It's not, the Talmud's not a book. The Talmud is not a book. The Talmud is a, is the, the soul of the Jewish people for thousands of years, the the divine will as it's been filtered through the minds and hearts and souls of the greatest leaders and scholars of, for thousands of years. It's not a book. You know, Torah, Torah is not a book. Torah is a, is, is a way of life. It's a, it's a pathway of connection to Hashem. And you learn that from a book, but you learn it more from watching a Torah scholar, watching somebody. The, the Gemara says that the Gemara says that the Babylonians were foolish because they would stand for a Torah scroll. When the Torah scroll would come in, you know, they'd open the ark and the Torah scroll would come out. They would stand for the Torah scroll. But when a Talmud Chacham, when a Torah scholar would walk by, they wouldn't stand. And they said, that's ridiculous because the Torah is, this is a scroll. It's, it's, it's the words of Torah in a book. A Talmud Chacham is a living embodiment of the divine will. It's somebody who's, who's every motion, every action, every word, every gesture is a reflection of the divine. So yeah, that's you know, that's true. Role models, you know, role models are very, very important. In that yeah, sense. You want to take Michelle again? You know, Brenda, there, there's one you more are. scenario I I think I could add into that. Oh, the parking lot. Yes, the parking lot, which is that maybe the young man who was waiting for the parking space had anger and patience and entitlement issues. <laughs> And this man comes to test him as a test from God to test his patience and test his willingness to stand by while a religious man takes his space. So God is saying, what are you going to do? You're going to go yell at him? You're going to go confront him and tell him that he took your space? You know, and, and maybe that whole scenario was a God designed scenario for the benefit of the young. And a third possibility is all of the above. Yes. Meaning that from for each person's point of view, exactly. it was a design test and challenge the for them. Them too, yeah, right? To judge or not to judge. Or to, yeah. Go and ahead. That's why it was so filled with torture. Yeah. yeah. On the other side, <laughs> right. the religious man could have stopped, opened his door and said, I have to go. It's, it's, I, I, it's an emergency. Please forgive me. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. There's so many different sides. Maybe the guy was just a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was the first thing. Larry, come on. I've seen this on Seinfeld. I know how this is going to happen. By the way, if, if, that, if that scenario that you're describing happened in Israel, oh, I mean, yeah. well, it happens every day. No one would even, no one would even like, you know, yeah, notice that something had happened. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, Ramchal concludes his discussion for the first factor that detracts from Zahiros by contrasting it with the other two. We'll conclude here. Um, this undermining factor, the under, remember, just important to know where we are. We're talking about the three factors that undermine one's ability to acquire this trait of vigilance. And the first one being our preoccupation with worldly matters. Two and three, which I didn't mention, are um, levity, our um, levity and mockery, which we'll talk about starting next week. I'm not going to be here. It's not a bad idea. Um, levity and mockery, um, which is which is a major detractor to living a serious, focused life. And the third one, which is the company that we keep, and how that can impact our ability to live a focused spiritual life. Those are two and three. He says this undermining factor, the one that we've been focusing on now, namely preoccupation with worldly matters, although it is the most prevalent of the three, right? Everybody struggles with that. How to prioritize my life, how to not let the urgencies overcome the vitalities. Um, it's nevertheless the easiest of the three to avoid, even though it's the most prevalent, it's the most common, but it's the easiest to avoid if one truly wishes to escape it. Okay, um, well, he'll talk about why that is. We'll see next week that levity and mockery are once they're ingrained inside of you, they're much harder to uproot. So we'll talk about that. Um, we'll meet next week uh, in person again, right? Next week should be should be able to do this live again. Is that right? Yeah. Next, yeah. 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 <coughs> and also, by the way, next week on Sunday we have the um, the picnic. The picnic is the Chaim Center picnic. No softball this year. <laughs> right there. Larry, no softball. No softball this year at the picnic. Oh, oh come on. on. There will be ambulances on site just in case. Though. Nice. I saw I saw Ron Ron Lazarus yesterday. Yeah. So I told him, don't forget, we're having a picnic next Sunday. He says, no softball. Um, okay. Great to see everybody. Have a great week. Shavuot Tov.